Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Show. You're listening to the first and only podcast dedicated to the business of pharmacy. You can find all of our episodes at PharmacyPodcast.com. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. I'm your co-host in 2017, focused on your career development, Aaron Albert. More on me over at my website, AaronAlbert.com, or let's connect via Twitter. My handle there is at Aaron L. Albert. And of course, you can always connect with us at Pharmacy Podcast. Today, we're focused on our Back to School RX mini series continuation. We've looked at business schools, we've looked at informatics, master's degrees, we've also even looked and explored the culinary arts. But today we're going to shift gears a little bit and focus on a PhD as a possibility for pharmacists. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, I spent, you know, six, seven, eight years to get my PharmD. Why would I consider another four, six, or even ten years to complete my PhD? I really wanted to explore this avenue with an expert in this arena, and the first person that came to mind was Dr. Isaiah Hankel. And I know him through his portal that he runs to help PhDs go from academia into industry careers predominantly. And he runs The Cheeky Scientist, and you can learn all about where he's at after our conversation and during. But give a listen to this, and we hope you enjoy this particular show, even if you don't go back and get a PhD. I don't know if I ever will or not, but it's fun to think about. So enjoy the show. I'm Isaiah Henkel. I'm the creator of the Cheeky Scientist Association, and you're listening to The Pharmacy Podcast. Dr. Isaiah Henkel, welcome to The Pharmacy Podcast. Thank you, Aaron. Great to be with you. Yeah, so I always love to start with a question because I focus on career development here at the podcast. How did you get to where you are today in your career? Uh, great question. I get this question a lot and I always like to say pain. Pain is what got me here and I think in general in people's professional lives and personal lives, pain is really what motivates them to take their take something to the next level to grow. Um, when we only have moderate pain, we don't tend to move to the next level. For example, you, you probably have people who are listening. They might be at a certain level in their careers. Maybe they just got uh, their pharmacy degree, whatever it is. Uh, they're not quite, quite where they thought they would be in their career. It's not until that pain gets bad enough that they're going to make a decision to do something different. And so for me, that's what got me there. I, I was at the end of my academic career track, and I realized that there was nothing left for me in academia. Uh, the traditional jobs that used to be there for PhDs in my case were not there. Um, the job statistics for PhDs were horrible and nobody had told us, we had no training. And so being in that position is what got me to where I am today because I decided, you know what, I don't want other PhDs to experience that pain um, ever. Fair enough. So tell us about the Cheeky Scientist, what it is, and how people can learn more about it. Yeah, so CheekyScientist.com would be the best place to start. And it's a it's a platform where uh, you can learn how to transition into industry careers. Our, our kind of tagline is uh, we turn academic PhDs into confident and successful industry professionals. Uh, we are the largest platform currently for PhDs uh, interested in industry careers. And what we do is we – it's really a kind of a two-prong approach. We give a blueprint for making that transition into industry, and we provide you with a, a PhD-only job referral network. Cool. And so let's rewind a little bit. You have your own PhD. What Before you attain that degree, what was your mindset, and why did you choose to do a PhD? Yeah, I think it's like a, a lot of us who go on to get these terminal degrees. It's because we're very driven people and we're uh, intelligent, uh, certainly book smart. We we trust ourselves in that if there's a, a career track to go down, we know that through hard work, um, we can get to the end of that career track. But we don't always think about, do I actually want to get to the end of that career track? Or what if things change and you know the job or whatever else we thought was going to be there isn't there anymore? Um, so my mindset when I came in, again, like a lot of people who go after terminal degrees, we were probably, you know, stars of, in our undergrad or in college, right? Um, at least in the sense of uh, being at the top of the class, 
uh, being the best in our, our labs or whatever it might have been. And then we go into, you know, uh, graduate school or, or pharmacy school or a PhD program, whatever it is. And we realize, hey, there's a lot of other really smart and driven people out there, too. Um, and this can be kind of our first experience with uh, having to deal with a different kind of failure and a different kind of competition. Uh, for me, though, I, I like that. On the background, it was always, okay, just keep doing this, keep learning, keep moving forward, and you'll be taken care of by the system. Um, but the problem is is that a lot of these terminal degrees now, when you get to that when you get to that terminal degree, right? You become terminal in terms of your job prospects. They're just not there. Certainly the case, I've seen the statistics for pharmacy jobs, certainly the case for uh, PhD jobs, professorships and so forth. They're, the statistics are harrowing. They're not, you know, the, those careers aren't there. The traditional career track academia in general does a horrible job of taking care of people who get these degrees after they get to the, de- the degree. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> not to go off of that note on a dark side, but <laughs> so why should, you know, this whole mini series that we're doing here for the podcast, we had over almost 40,000 hits on LinkedIn about it. So it's a hot topic. Pharmacists want to talk about it. So why should a pharmacist consider going back and earning a PhD? Yeah. And, and you bring up the dark side. I think it's important to understand the problem and the dark side because then you can understand the solution and the uh, you can see the light, right? Yeah. And so in this case, getting the degree is not the problem. And I always want to make clear on that. Like you get a, a pharmacy degree, you go on to get another advanced degree. That's not the problem. It's that during the process of getting that degree, you are most likely not going to be trained on how to leverage that degree properly. So that's the difference. Now, in this case, should a pharmacy uh, student consider getting a PhD? Yes, if you know what you're going to do with that PhD. Uh, same with the, the, the pharmacy degree itself. You know, you should only go in to get a, a PharmD if you know what you're going to do with it. The problem is most of us don't know. When we get into the system, the academic system only trains us on what's the next step in terms of academia or the very traditional next step, um, even if it's outside of academia. But in today's world, you can leverage it in a lot of different ways. So for example, if you're considering getting a PhD after getting your PharmD, I would say only do it if you know how to leverage your PhD afterwards. Now, you can learn that along the way, but you need to keep it to the, the front of your mind because nobody is going to train you on the way. You have to train yourself. Okay, so let's break down the pluses and minuses of a PhD. So a PhD is is great in terms of your ability to solve problems, right? So I, I, a PhD literally means doctor of philosophy. Now, philosophy means uh, knowledge and the ability to ascertain knowledge. So by getting a PhD, you're, you're literally becoming a doctor of learning. Um, and, and this is crucial because you can leverage that. Uh, no other degree is as innovative as a PhD because to get your PhD, and I'm sure this is arguable, which is fine, but to get your PhD, it is one of the only terminal degrees where you have to actually push a field forward on paper by getting a, a publication or through a, your thesis committee meetings. You have to actually push a field forward um, with something brand new that's never been discovered, never been thought about, never been created before. Uh, a master's degree, certainly most degrees, you have to master a field, but with a PhD, you have to push it forward. Now, why is that important? Because once you get your PhD, you can get high-level jobs in industry, right, in business in general, by leveraging the fact that you are incredible at learning on the job, um, because again, you have that doctor of learning, and you know how to innovate. And innovation is so important nowadays, especially in if we think of like STEM fields, like biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, and so forth, healthcare, healthcare overall. Mm-hmm. So I, I admit, I'll be the first one to admit that part of me is looking at the PhD as like my own personal holy grail because it's the one degree that I don't have done mm. yet for myself. So I've looked and I think a lot of pharmacists might struggle with this as well. The part-time versus full-time PhD. You know, we're in the era of online education, etc. But there still doesn't seem to be a lot of PhD programs that are flexible. Mm. Yeah, very few because – especially if we're talking about the healthcare industry, as we would say STEM mm-hmm. uh, PhDs, you're going to have to work in a, a wet lab in many cases or in some sort of lab where you physically have to be there. Uh, certainly life sciences, physical sciences, you know, if it's engineering or something, you, you can uh, – you know, there might be some solutions. But for right now, you have to do that intensive training 
that will allow you to push a field forward. Now, there are some PhDs like uh, in statistics, for example, where you can do a lot of it remotely. Uh, there are some uh, new options that are becoming available there. But in the traditional sense, there's not a lot of part time. And if anything, it's becoming something that is taking longer and longer to do. Overall, I think for all PhDs, the average in the U.S. is uh, it can take six to ten years. In STEM, wow. it's closer to probably six years. Um, but it is a full-on process that you need to consider carefully because it takes a long time and there is currently no part-time option for the most part. How is how is PH how are PhDs paid for? I guess because I my understanding is some of them have um, stipends associated with them. Some of them have uh, consideration for teaching. How does yes. that part work? Yeah, so that might be a, a silver lining in some cases if you're getting other degrees first where you've had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars per year um, or, or overall for your education. You can get a PhD um, and essentially and get paid to get it. Uh, okay. You will be working uh, you know, 12 to 18 hour days in a lab. Um, so it, it, there is a, a price for it, but for graduates, for a graduate, like a PhD student, you're looking at a stipend of, I don't know, the national average is somewhere around probably taking home 1500 bucks a month. Okay. Um, maybe 1300 I mean, it depends on which state, of course, and which university. But you can get paid to do that, so that is an option. Same thing with teaching. You can get this kind of stipend. There are fellowships or grants you can get. Um, it's not. It's just enough to barely live on, and keep you from hopefully not having to get another loan. Yeah. So let's fast forward because I know you have a lot of statistics around that, uh, around the topic of post PhD. So what does the career scene look like for somebody that already has his or her PhD? Yeah. So one statistic that uh, well should jump out at you is that PhD students when they graduate. In the life sciences, 80% face unemployment and 60% overall for all PhD types face unemployment. And it's because, not because their PhD is not valuable outside of academia, it's because they haven't been trained on how to get jobs outside of academia and there are no jobs in academia for PhDs. Um, so they're faced with abject unemployment or a postdoc where you are paid – Maybe, maybe 30 to 40 at most grand a year, and you're still working those 18-hour days in academia. That's your traditional track. That track used to lead to a professorship very quickly, but now it doesn't because all tenured professorships are gone. As an example, every year, just in the U.S., over 60,000 PhDs are granted, and this is going up up to 20% year over year. Wow. They're just handing them out because universities need more grant funding. They get more grant funding for the more PhDs they give out. Etc. However, when it comes to tenure professorships, uh, I'm sorry, professorships in general, less than 4,000 open up per year. Wow. So there's, a, there's again, a, like 60,000 PhDs who couldn't even get a professorship if they wanted, have no training on how to get jobs outside of academia, and that's why there's this stacking up of postdocs in academia. So a postdoc is your post, it would be your postgraduate work. Um, again, these PhDs get their degree don't know what to do with it to go into a postdoc you used to a postdoc used to last one to two years and then you'd get a professorship now the average is six to ten years and most people do multiple postdocs for about a two to three year period and they'll do two or three postdocs um so if that if you're going to get your phd make sure you know that you need to start networking bin, building up your industry career making sure that you know what your job options are and what you want outside of academia before you actually get that phd degree because there's not going to be a lot of training available for you in your phd and the academic system is still going to push you to doing that postdoc and that professorship even though the positions aren't there so let's talk about the light side what what do you what types of career paths do you push your cheeky scientist tribe into considering outside yeah, so, of the academia great question and you know so there are 30,000 or so PhDs every year just in the US getting into industry jobs and these are great paying industry jobs now the average that a PhD will make in industry um, in a STEM field is over $90,000 a year 
So the pay is very good. I mean, it's you're going to be less than half of that if you stay in academia and a postdoc. So the key is just getting your PhD and realizing that you need to get outside of academia into industry. And there are a lot of very hot positions right now. The hottest overall is a medical science liaison. Uh, this used to be a position that only MDs would get into, but now PhDs are getting into them because of their their knowledge you know, within a specific field or, you know, a protein pathway or things that are important for drug development. Uh, this is a, a very hot field. Um, more and more management consulting firms are hiring PhDs now as well, because again, a PhD, it's that doctor of learning. They're able to learn things very, very quickly on their own and dive very deeply into topics. So those are kind of the two hottest fields that we see PhDs going into and where those employers are actually actively looking for PhDs. So is a PhD only really for the hard sciences? I know you came from a hard science as, with your own PhD, or do you see a trend with people returning um, in healthcare for softer sciences like psychology or even like a DBA instead of a PhD? Well, great question. So the National Science Foundation now considers the social sciences under the STEM banner as okay. a hard science. So any any science that uses the scientific method, including psychology, sociology, and so forth, can be considered under STEM. I think those are all great fields, and I would encourage those. Now, the only the only fields that I would not encourage anyone to get a PhD in is unless they just love it and they don't ever need money <laughs> is in the humanities, right? So if you want to get a PhD in like French history, for example, uh, the statistics are just so horrible. You're going to be in that PhD for about 10 years until you finally graduate. And then your job prospects are not good. On average, a humanities PhD is lucky to make $60,000 after that 10 years of schooling for the degree. Wow. Okay. Well, on back to the bright side, <laughs> you've written a book. Tell us about your book. Yeah. So the, the first book I wrote was uh, Black Hole Focus. It was published a couple years ago. The audio book is just about to be released. And it details a, a bit of my personal story of transitioning out of academia into an industry career and really how to leverage your PhD to get into a top job. Um, a PhD is very, very valuable. Again, I want to reiterate that, but you know, I'm not going to mince any words about staying in academia. Like you just have to know what to do with your degree. Just like I'm sure you and other people who get their pharmacy degrees realize, Hey, I need, I should have had a plan or I need to get a plan for once I get that degree. So the book talks about that and, and it goes through a step-by-step -step process of helping you figure out exactly what you need to do to make sure you have a plan in place and to get to that career that's right for you. Cool. And so one more time, how can people connect with you online and or the Cheeky Scientist? It's CheekyScientist.com. And then if uh, I'm very active on the, the Facebook page, I think we have almost we have over, over 50,000 uh, fans there. So the Cheeky Scientist Facebook page is just Facebook.com backslash my Cheeky Scientist. Well, with that, Dr. Isaiah Hankel, thank you for joining us on the Pharmacy Podcast with a wide open view of the Ph.D., Thank you, Aaron. Are you ready for our speed round? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So what books are you reading right now? Uh, so I just finished a book called Predictably Irrational. Great book if you like any sort of behavioral psychology topics. It uh, talks about how we make decisions, and it's on this theme of this other book that I am about to finish, which is called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's by Daniel Kahneman. He won the Nobel Prize. Uh, talks about how in terms of economics, decisions, behavioral psychology, we really rely on reference points, not just rational decisions. What podcasts are you listening to right now? Other than this one, uh, <laughs> I listen to uh, the, the Tim Ferriss podcast is really good. There's a, a podcast by Jason Gagnard called, uh, I believe it's called Community Built that I like as well. And then uh, AJ Jacobs has a, a good podcast too. What's your one word to describe the U.S. healthcare system? I would say caged. I mean, just unlimited potential, but right now it just seems to be tied down by a lot of uh, regulations and competing uh, kind of uh, desires and ideals. What's the hottest trend you've seen in higher education and PhD programs kind of overall in the last five to 10 years? A uh, couple of things. I mean, I talked about in terms of jobs that medical science liaison position is just super hot right now. Um, within academia itself, though, a lot of universities have set up these tech transfer offices, and uh, more and more we're seeing universities uh, – 
pair with even VC firms, spinoffs and stuff, especially when they are located near a, a biotech or biopharmaceutical cluster. And last but not least, what's the best career advice you ever received? Best advice ever uh, is follow up as if you are already working for the person you want to connect with. And the thing that we see holding back people the most in their careers, uh, especially people with degrees from academia, is their inability to follow up. They feel like they're stalking or they're annoying somebody. And so following up consistently every week or two by adding value, not by asking for stuff, is a game changer. And we say, you know, act like you're already working for them, find them materials they'd be interested in and talk about the things that they're interested in, not about yourself. Um, if you provide enough value, they will get back to you sooner or later and they'll provide value back. Uh, one last note there is the key is not doing anything sort of passive aggressive, such as, you know, if you, you reach out to somebody, you don't hear some, something back and you say, hey, just checking in to see if you got my last email. Um, you never have to mention your previous messages. Just keep adding value and they will get back to you and they'll add value in return sooner or later. Keep adding value. I love that. Dr. Isaiah Hankel, thank you again for being part of the podcast. You're welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Pharmacy Podcast. We hope you found this PhD episode interesting. Again, Dr. Hankel's book is called Black Hole Focus. I've read it myself and I highly recommend it. As well, he talked a little bit about the medical science liaison. And as you know, you avid listeners, we've already discussed that topic as well. I have a book called The Medical Science Liaison, an A to Z guide available on Amazon.com. And we'll link all of these details up in show notes. Again, we hope you enjoyed this mini series. If you have any questions about the series or returning to school, you can use our hashtag on social media and ask your questions or giving a good listen to it. The hashtag back to school RX. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. My name is Aaron Albert.